Justice. Mr. Mr. Skidmore, Ms. Schroeder, in particular with respect to the having the court system formally approving a risk assessment tool, does that create a separation of powers issue? Mr. Skidmore looks like he got the short straw. For the record, this is John Skidmore, Director of the Criminal Division for the State of Alaska Department of Law. <clears throat> the question um, you've posed, Mr. Chairman, is whether or not there would be a separation of powers issue. And my short answer is I don't know. Um, I could see that that would be a possibility where you have one branch having to approve what another branch is doing, but I don't know that it necessarily is a, a problem. I, I would need to look at that uh, more thoroughly. Um, so that's the, the one question you've asked me is um, whether or not having the court system having to approve it is a separation of powers problem. And I'm. Okay, you've answered that question. Any, sorry, Representative Eastman, any further questions for Mr. Skidmore as to amendment two? Um, sure, well, since the Department of Law is a player in this amendment. Um, what's, what's the department's uh, thoughts on the amendment itself? Through the chair, Representative Eastman, uh, in, in looking at the amendment uh, just from a legal standpoint of what it's requiring is that the uh, Department of Corrections would develop the tool and then the tool um, has to be approved by law, public safety, and the court system. Um, legally, that's what it would seem to require from a from a policy standpoint, I, I guess I always uh, think about um, making final decisions as a manager and I think about um, do you want to have three different people having to make the final decision or not. Um, and then from the standpoint of the assessment tool itself, what I can tell you is both the Department of Law and the court system have been involved in consulting with uh, the Department of Corrections on the development of the tool. So if this change were made, I, I don't know um, what everyone would say. I think the Department of Law would certainly approve the tool as it exists because we've been involved in the consultations up to this point. Um, but in terms of the amendment from a legal standpoint of whether this is good policy or not, I, I haven't had an opportunity to go through that process of vetting. I described it earlier that any change that's going to be made in policy is something that um, I wouldn't want to make on my own. That's something I would be discussing with others in the department, and I haven't had an opportunity to do that yet. Thank so, you. Representative Christ Tompkins. Thank you. Um, Mr. Skidmore, um, given the amendment as written, what would happen if uh, the Department of Law hypothetically withheld approval for developing the risk assessment instrument or uh, perhaps an alternative hypothetical if the court system withheld approval. What, if, if either of those hypotheticals were to come to be, uh, what would happen? Through the chair, uh, Representative Christ Tompkins, I think that if any one of the three entities listed there were to um, not approve the tool, then it would not be allowed to be used. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can I follow up? Representative Millett. Why would we want a risk, or risk assessment tool out there that Department of Law didn't approve? Um, through the chair, Representative Millett, uh, I think it ultimately comes down to a policy question of who is it that you want to have to make the final approval. Do you want it to be the Department of Law? Um, if I try and step back as a representative of the Department of Law and come at it from a societal standpoint, do you want the prosecutors to be deciding um, whether or not an assessment tool is appropriate for the release of a person that's incarcerated? Um, I, I could certainly see there are some in society that might not agree with that. Um, so I, I think it really is just a policy call of wh who it is you ultimately want to have uh, make that determination. Thank you. I see that the 
court system attorney is here. So thank you, Ms. Mead, for responding quickly to our call. <laughs> We're under discussion of amendment number two. Are you familiar with amendment number two? Do you need a minute to review? I just took a minute to review it, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And I believe that Representative Eastman had a question. So I'll let Representative Eastman pose his question. Um, thank you. Through the chair. Uh, and my question is, uh, having reviewed the amendment, what's, what's the court system's uh, position on the policy? Uh, through the Chair Representative Eastman, we don't have a position on the policy. And if, if that's something that the legislature passes, we would uh, then take a different look at the risk assessment tool and decide whether to approve it. I follow up? Representative Eastman. And obviously the, uh, the court system has uh, certainly a great interest in, in having a good risk assessment instrument. It, does the court system have any um, uh, concerns or, or possible objections to the current uh, uh, instrument as it you know exists currently, or or have have those concerns already been addressed and resolved? Uh, through the chair, Representative Eastman, um, the the risk assessment tool uh, was very recently developed. All of this happened over the past few months. It was unveiled to a group of interested participants, me among them, uh, as well as two judges who were, were asked to work on this pretrial services implementation. And uh, it was unveiled with a lot of explanation and a lot of data and a lot of science um, explanation of why it was developed this way. There was a level of trust put into some individuals who did that. But when presented, it was. Uh, to me personally, quite an impressive uh, piece of work. Um, it was uh, tested on different populations. They had uh, things about how it will affect different genders, how it will affect different races, uh, all within the state of Alaska and using state of Alaska data. Now, do I have 100% buy-in that things will work perfectly in January? I, I can't say that. Um, whether the uh, court system would approve of the tool as written, that would be a decision for the Supreme Court, who frankly hasn't seen the tool at all yet. But right now, we're very actively working on um, making sure that the judges know about the tool. In fact, that's tomorrow and this week. All the judges are being trained on what, what went into the tool, what your new bail statute will require. And really, for most of the judges, and I, I feel certain for most of the Supreme Court, that will be their first time that they see the tool and understand, I hope, what is to be done with the tool and how it will impact them. More information is always better, so people are open to seeing that. Thank you very much. And I would note that one member of the Supreme Court, Justice Bolger, is a member of the Criminal Justice Commission, so he has seen the tool in his status on the Criminal Justice Commission. Uh, Representative Christ Tompkins. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I'm in intrigued by the amendment because it seems to be getting at ensuring that sort of left hand is talking with the right hand and maybe even in a bigger way across different branches of government and um, in line with Representative Cop's question, or maybe kind of in line with Representative Cop's question, are you familiar with any linkages or articulations across between the executive branch and the judicial branch in law right now in which the executive branch requires something, there's statutory language with the word shall, um, requires something or approval from the judicial branch, whether there's sort of any precedent for this um, kind of relationship that Amendment uh, N.35 proposes. Through the Chair Representative Christ Tompkins, I am not. I. I I would point you to subsection 6 on this very same page. This is out of SB 91 that says that the implementation of this tool is to be done. I mean, it says it in so many words that, that the DOC shall adopt regs in consultation with law, PD, DPS, OVR, and the court system in order to implement this. So it, it is the direction of that subsection 6 that has led to what I referred to as this very large pretrial services implementation group. Uh, DOC has clearly taken the lead. They have hired their 
There are 20 or 30 staffers, a very capable uh, woman to oversee the division with very um, top-notch folks at the, in the head for, to uh, supervise each judicial district. But we, we, are, we go to meetings, almost my full-time job is going to the meetings to see how it's going. I, people from the judicial branch give input, me included, and it is considered and done. They're very accommodating. Now, now again, it's, it's, it's maybe words. I, I'm not aware that anything would be sunk if the Supreme Court says, sorry, no approval. I'm not aware of that happening anywhere else in statute. But right now, it seems to be a, a group that's operating effectively under, under six. Follow-up, Representative Christ Tompkins. Um, so so uh, noting subsection six, which is about consultation, sort of a, uh, a strong suggestion, but not a requirement. I just wanted to confirm, you're not aware of any sort of uh, uh, articulation between executive branch and judicial branch that requires approval for the executive branch to do something, or requires judicial branch granting approval in order to do something. Through the chair, Representative for Christ Tompkins, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain that that doesn't exist elsewhere, although there are other suggestions to consult with the other branches. In, in, if I may, Mr. Sure, Chair, Representative Christ Thompson, uh, sort of po positing an idea. I, I mean, I do like the idea of the communication and agency collaboration, ideally, which I think we all hope is going to happen, regardless of whether this amendment goes forward or not. And hopefully, there there is this coordination on the Justice Commission and in the executive branch. But um, I, I mean, I just to sort of put it out there, perhaps looking at um, revising the amendment to be more in that sort of consultation vein and require the consultation, but maybe not a hard approval. I'll just put that out there, maybe for future discussion. Uh, Representative Fansler. Um, this is more of a comment, if that's okay, since we're in discussion. Um, well, actually, we were still in questions. Oh, we so, haven't left but questions But we, we will come to discussions. Okay. I, I do have a question for Ms. Mead, though. Kind of a little bit more specific follow-up. Here, what you've got, and if the, in Section 5, under the law as currently framed, the Department of Corrections comes up with an assessment tool using regulations that, if they haven't been adopted, they certainly include a bunch of people, but or a bunch of agencies. But you've got the prosecutor's office who may or may not agree with the determination about how a particular defendant is released. They would be appearing before a judge who is a works for the court system, and we want that person to be independent. Are there separation of powers issues that come up if you have the court system essentially approving the assessment tool and formally taking that step that, that arise now when you're asking a judge to independently decide what do I do about an objection from the Department of Law as to what's in a risk assessment tool? How do, does, that, does that start trending into separation of powers issues and impacting independence of the courts? To the chair, I, I I completely understand that th that is a potential problem, and and I maybe that's why there is no other place in statute where the court must approve something that the executive branch does, uh, because if the court is on record as saying I believe in this tool and I believe it is accurate, that leaves little room for somebody likely a defense person in that scenario, to challenge the tool or think, but it didn't take into account the person's employment history or, the, or something like that. And the court, just as I am always neutral, <laughs> uh, wants to retain the ability to uh, assess uh, whether something is legal or uh, good with full briefing and in the context of litigation. And so approving something ahead of time uh, could be something like, well, we approve it, but we might later say that there is a flaw with it because the court system doesn't give sort of um, uh, advisory opinions on whether something is good before it's been fully briefed to the court. So, so how the Supreme Court would, would reach the approval or disapproval decision is puzzling to me. They would not have all the information to decide whether that was valid or not in the absence of full briefing by interested parties. And that would be, in, in the essence, like an advisory opinion, which we don't do. Representative Fansler, a question? Uh, yeah. 
and then we'll turn to discussion of the amendment. I hope we break for lunch fairly quickly. Through the chair, uh, thank you. Um, I, I guess I just forgive my naivety, uh, but I, that's not the right word. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, who would be making these decisions that would be approving these at each of these different levels? Is this the Supreme Court is approving this? Is this someone else when you're talking about the court system? Um, it, it, through the chair, Rep Representative Fanzler, uh, the court, this, the, this amendment says that the Alaska court system would have to approve something. Uh, to me, the only person who could do that is some decision by the Alaska Supreme Court. We don't have superior court judges or administrators that work for the court system deciding whether something another branch did is, is valid or good policy. Uh, we, we don't do that. And so that would have to be something by the Supreme Court. And again, the Supreme Court um, wouldn't really have the information to make a binding decision about whether something that the DOC has created is um, is useful or helpful or efficient or not. Um, so it's 5 after 12. I wanted to break for lunch at noon. Um, I'm, if we want to go to discussion, and I don't want to cut off questions if people have questions. If we want to go to discussion, I'm willing to try to push through and act on this amendment before we break for lunch. But if there's more questions, I'm thinking we should break for lunch. Let's break for lunch. Representative Eastman. Well, I'll just say um, I'm fine with breaking for lunch now. I know we've, we've heard from courts okay. and well, we'll Department of Law. Can, I, can we get uh, Department of Public Safety in the queue to, so we can ask them as well? Uh, we'll or after lunch. We will try. Thank you. Uh, we're going to recess um, until 